What is up, fanatic? It's 8 p.m. Mountain Time on a Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Home Theater Fanatic Live. And today, this is about as home theater as you can get, right? Uh, you know, sometimes we'll kind of tangent off, but we'll have a guest. It's not so much home theater, but this one is all about home theater. And I'm really super excited to introduce everybody to Chris Kane from Audio Control. And uh, if you guys don't know, Audio Control is making some killer AVR and pre-pro devices for home theaters, and they are super exciting. So, Chris, welcome, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Thanks, Giles. Good to have you. And we're glad to be here. So oh, you're like, this is my show now. I know. I'm, I'm just, I'm still just, digesting the, the build, the lead in there, the 60 second countdown. That was so dramatic, and you know, I'm like, wow, this is cool. I, super dramatic, right? I mean, yeah, because, yeah. You know, if there's one thing I am, it's dramatic. I feel really oh. Yeah, so let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about you and let everybody know who Audio Control is. So um, first, I guess everybody knows you work for Audio Control. It's on your shirt, right? You're, you're branded. Um, yeah. But yeah, tell us tell us who you are, Chris, so people kind of get a feel for who they're who they're looking at on the screen today. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm uh, I've been with Audio Control now for my gosh, uh, almost thirty years. Um, just and, a, just uh, a little I, while. Just a little bit, you know, waiting for another gig to come together and stuff sure. like that. So, but uh, no, I lived uh, lived in Southern California for a big chunk of my life and uh, ran a stereo store down there. And uh, at some point, uh, we decided to move on from Southern California. Um, those of you that live in Southern California might know why, but uh, it was just time to do something different. And uh, there was this uh, little company up here in Seattle called Audio Control. I met the owner of the company and flew up here uh, in '92 and. Fourth of July and it rained. Of course, that's you know the Seattle. Of course, of life. exactly. So there was no no hiding. You know what was going on here, um, and I uh, ended up coming to to work here. And uh, I started life as managing the uh, just consumer sales, and then I did uh, sales and international, and then sales and marketing. Um, so I've been you know surrounded by a really good group of folks. And you know it's a neat company because um, you know we're not only do we were a designer and a manufacturer of audio products, you know, and I think that's really what's always stood out to me as something that's kind of unique, you know, it's easy to kind of get your hands around something or even more so be involved in the design of, uh, of a particular piece of product or whatnot. And sometimes it takes two or three years for that to come to fruition, but it's kind of neat to say, hey, I was there when that happened at the beginning or to be able to talk to people and get feedback from people and bring that back to the engineering team and the manufacturing team here. So that's awesome. You know, I can, you know, you're, you're talking about like the 92 time frame, you know, back then with audio control. And I remember you guys from back then too. Now at, at that time I had no, you know, no home theater kind of anything. Right. And gosh, I mean, there wasn't that much stuff back then anyway, but one thing that did exist that I was all about was car audio. Right. Oh, uh, no. So, uh, you know, I, I remember the good old audio control from, from way back then. And uh, you guys still carry that that tradition on today, right? So it's not just home theater devices, but you know, let's uh, you know maybe this is a chance to kind of talk about the portfolio and all the stuff that Audio Control does build and, and sell. No, definitely. Um, and you're right. I mean, so I guess a lot of our our fans out there know us from different places. You know, we started predated me. We started in the '70s. Actually, a guy named Greg Mackey. Uh, okay. Started Audio Control. 
Um, did he make Mackie audio later? He did. He is the same guy. Okay. Yeah, same guy. Oh, same guy. He's he's he and a bunch cool. of you know. If you know, one of the things that attracted me about Seattle, obviously, there's a lot of music up here, um, and, and you know the uh, Pearl Jams and and uh, Heart and all those bands came out of here. A lot of musicians up here, and uh, and Greg had uh, a fair amount of friends, you know, when he was uh, starting up. And there wasn't a lot of audio companies back in the '70s, um, you know, if you wanted hi-fi. And so you'd go out, you go to a, a hi-fi store. They called hi-fi at the time, and you buy some speakers, and they would sound a certain way inside the store. And then you would take them home, and maybe you put them in your corners, or you you put them on your hardwood floors, or you would do whatever. And lo and behold, they didn't sound the same as when they were in the store. Yeah, and strange so, that. Yeah, exactly. So people would come back to the store and say, "Hey, what's wrong with the speaker?" and that's kind of where equalization, kind of our early products came into play, where, you know, we had the ability to kind of fine tune the sound and it gave the end user the ability. And some of these, you, you know, your listeners may be familiar with our, our 520, which was a little five bands of VQ with a couple of pieces of wood bolted onto the side. It looked like a Heath kit product, if I'm dating myself a little bit. And, oh, that's funny. Right. Yeah. On. People look on that. And then we started coming out with products with flashing lights and RTAs built into them. So it gave you the I would. To actually, I would love to have like a vintage style, and I don't know if this product exists, um, RTA, so a big one, right, with a whole bunch of bands so the, I can just watch the lights dance. Oh, it's, it's I, intoxicating. It's intoxicating, I, definitely. I, I need one of those. I don't know why, but I just do. I think that'd be awesome. We, we have a few around here, and people, you're right, just stare at the lights. And, uh, you know, and, and while it's there to kind of help balance sound, it is kind of funny to watch people, you would watch people close their eyes and tune it, and then you would invariably end up with a smiley face curve, you know, like the Fletcher Munson curve. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, psh, psh. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which, You're like, more bass, more bass, more bass. Oh, treble, enough. treble, mid range, no. Just yeah, exactly. It. Bass was the thing. Well, we had, we had early enthusiasts, and this kind of segues a little bit in the karate, who would take some of those home products, and then in the 80s, they start shoving those in the trunks of their cars. Right, and they would modify them and shove them underneath the uh, dashboard, or more so in the trunk and stuff like that. And that's when car audio really started to take off, and people started doing sound off contests and and things like that. And they said, "Hey, I need to have an equalizer." So they used some of our home audio, you know, rack mount, <laughs> shove it under the dashboard in the back. And then eventually, we said, "Well, let's take those features and let's put them into a form factor that probably you're a lot more familiar with now, the little metal boxes. That can, little metal boxes. Yeah, they can now bolt under a seat or under a dash or something like that. So that's kind of where our, our car audio side of life took off. And um, and that continued on into sound quality, and then we got into SPL types of events over time. And now, actually, we do a lot of business um, and put a lot of our engineering into um, OEM integration. You know, if okay. you, you bought a new car in the last five or ten years, you probably know it's got a lot of the stuff in the dash that you like already. But it may not sound the way you want, you know, lacking in bass and speakers and stuff like that. So we have a bunch of devices that kind of help, you know, integrate on that side of things. So that's that's what kind of launched us in the car audio side of things. And whereas car had its own little group of enthusiasts and, and shops you would go to home, started having its own little group of enthusiasts and such. And then when I, I started with a company, I remember traveling around and it's kind of interesting you know, the fact that you're home theater fanatics, you know, so I would go around and you'd go to an audio shop and, or maybe a shop that sold TVs, you know, and back then it was Proton or Curtis, you know, Oh the sure, TV, yeah. the audio guys didn't sell TVs. It was sacrilegious, you know, like, oh, right. oh, we don't do that kind of stuff. And it took a few years and we actually had a product called the video sound tracker that had a, like a little eighth inch jack on it. I've never yeah. even heard of that before. Yeah, it was an old, old 19, circa 1987. And it was a little processor that would basically, it basically would let you take the headphone jack from your TV you plug it in the video sound tracker, and then it had RCA, so you could plug it into your receiver and your preamp, and that was home theater. And I remember coming back from a trip, and it was like this epiphany where I'm like, "Oh my gosh, people are plugging TVs in their stereos finally!" You know, and it's happening. Yeah, oh my exactly. god! It was mono. It started mono, and then from mono it became two channel, and then that synthesized three, four, and five as AC threes and all that kind of stuff came around. Um, and then you fast forward to what we're doing now with 16 channels and, uh, you know, built-in DSP and, uh, you know, room correction and calibration and stuff. So, so yeah, we've gone off in a lot of different directions. Um, and along the way, we also make mics and analyzers and stuff that we sell to the pro world. So, but that's right cool. on. Yeah. Cool. So let me, I'm going to pull this. I've got a, a screen share going. So let me see if I can show this. So oh, there it um, is. 
yeah so you've got car home and pro right so let's let's start on the the car side of the house um let me get it in the screen there we go bam all right cars let's see a factory upgrade all right so is are, are these boxes that kind of like sit in between um the the head unit of the the car and then you can add on more easily amplification and that kind of stuff is that what these are doing exactly yep they have either speaker level inputs so i mean a lot of these car radios uh now actually or car factory car amplifiers are crossed over inside the amplifier so coming out of the amp as opposed to a full range it could be a high mid and a low right yep or it could be a front and rear so our processors take those various signals bring them inside the processor and then we sum them together so you can get a nice clean full range signal and then you can use that full range signal to kind of decide hey i want to have a, a nice three-way system in the front with subs or if i want front and rear and subs and things like that so a lot of a lot of flexibility there and then yeah. different levels of equalization depending on how crazy your speaker locations are and you know what you want to do from the system there yeah no that's that's cool this dq61 it's got lots of spinny dials on it and i like that exactly yeah you know, the, and the lights don't matter so much because you know it's hidden but i like the spinny dials <laughs> flashing, flashing lights we always joke we should make a product that will just have flashing rta lights we'll stick it on the dash and it'll be rca in rca out and we'll just loop the wires together and people will buy it so mm -hmm. people will buy it totally exactly. All right, so I mean, and you cover the the gambit here. You got DSP, you got amplification. Oh, and this is the one. If people don't know, oh. this I think is the audio control product of all time, the epicenter, right? Absolutely. So this this is the one. I mean, and I I've never actually had one before, but uh, I've always wondered why doesn't audio control make an epicenter? For home theater well coming full circle we did actually we uh, what yeah the original prior to the epicenter this is where i'm dating myself again we had a product called the phased couple activator great name okay, um, yeah no that's so bad yeah I know. <laughs> bad. it was a sub it's a subharmonic synthesizer that looks at the upper octaves and recreates the lower octaves which is what the epicenter does and it needs to see a full range signal. So it was great for two channel systems where you had pre out main ends or you'd run from your processor into that. Um, and uh, did an amazing job. We sold tons of them. And that was one of the products that people started shoving in the trunks of their cars. Sure. Said, well, let's come out with a car version. So in 19, gosh, 87, 88, we came out with the epicenter. And everybody went, what the heck is that? You know? And so, I mean, it's one of those crazy products. It's almost a, 30 plus 35 year life. I think we've just crossed over selling a million of these things. Oh my God. Um, that's, that's awesome. Oh yeah. It's a neat, and it's so much fun too, because you can put it in and you can just listen to your system. It's got a cool little knob and you create more bottom end and things like that. Home theater got a little more complicated because you have the effects channels and the sub channels coming out. So for the epicenter to do its magic in there, it takes a lot more wiring and things like that. And, and or, that so. or, yeah. You just embed the technology in your pre-pro. Just, you just there saying, you if you make a pre-pro, you just embed it in your. So here's here's the thing, and you know this is uh this is something that I've thought about a little bit, but there is this whole subculture, and it's really funny because you can call it a subculture because it is a culture about subwoofers, um, with this that use this tool called base management, right, and. Uh, and it, it's not, you know, adjusting the levels of your subwoofers, but it's actually looking at your source content. So folks will take a movie, right? And they'll look at this movie and the different versions, maybe it's the Blu-ray or the 4K edition or whatever. They'll analyze the audio track and you can identify the filters that were applied to that track before it was pressed to disc, right? So um, what you'll see is a lot of times they'll put like a 24 decibel crossover uh, starting at 20 hertz and knock out all the subsonics, right? So the information is there, but it just rolls off. And maybe it's a six decibel roll. Who, what, you know, if it's different for different things. But folks look at that and then they re-engineer what that needs to look like. So they'll, they'll say, okay, to eliminate the impact of this roll off crossover, these are the settings that you put into your EQ right to kind of bring that back up to flat so obviously they can't create the audio information but they can boost it back up to some semblance of what it would have been if there hadn't been a filter put on it right so you get that so it's kind of doing what the epicenter uh, does oh yeah. 
kind of right and that's like a big thing and so for folks to do that today they have they take like uh um the the subwoofer out channel so that's the sum of the lfe plus all of the crossed over base content out of the the other speakers and they run that through like a mini dsp 2x4 hd or something like that from uh from mini dsp and uh, that's got the capability to put in both all of your output channel uh eq but you can also do an input side eq so you can have both running at the same time so what runs all the time is the output side eq to level you know get all your subs leveled out and do all your tuning and that kind of stuff but for each movie you can on the input side load in that base management setting for the movie you're going to watch and then bam you just earthquaked your movie right you know you just your epicenter actioned it up right so i'm just saying if you guys want to take this market by storm You've got, you've got the two pieces. You've got your pre-pro. You've got the epicenter. Just put them together in the processor. How cool would that be? I wrote, I wrote that down, Charles. I hope you can do that. Everybody that, that's watching, they're like, oh, God, here goes Giles again. Yeah, exactly. Those crazy ideas. And he's got a manufacturer listening. Oh, my God. No, but that's, that's kind of cool. But, the, you know, the epicenter, um, let me pull this back up. But this, I mean, this. I mean, this was the thing. I, I mean, back in the day with, uh, with car audio, I mean, if you were if you were cool, this is what you had. It probably oh, yeah. even cost more back then than it does now. <laughs> I'm sure it's, it did. It's the, same, it's the same price as it was. You know, <laughs> right on. That's awesome. So, ago, yeah. so yeah, the price has come down in you know in, in relative. Relative, dollars. yeah, exactly. I don't know what else. That's cool. But let's uh, let's let's flip over to the home stuff because this is uh you know this is what this channel is all about, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, you guys make, and, I, and I've seen these at uh, Cedia, uh, you know, great AVRs as well as pre-pros. And, uh, you know, a little bit later in the episode, I really want to dig into the whole AVR versus pre-pro and kind of answer that question. Um, but for now, you know, I think it's cool that we can just call out that those exist. Um, you also have power amplifiers, sub amplifiers, but then you guys are also pretty big in multi-zone um, home audio right you know including stuff like 70 volt kind of stuff multi-zone amplifiers can can you talk a little bit about that and let folks kind of know you know what you got going on there yeah no i mean distributed audio i mean it, which you know is, is another category that's kind of evolved you know started out as kind of i think in a lot of customers minds or people's minds is background music but nowadays with um speaker systems people are getting better and better architectural speakers in their house and less and less of the box speakers. Maybe you have a, a box or enclosure speaker in certain places uh, like main listening rooms. But the rest of your house, you want to have that same experience. And it went from one main, you know, let's face it, it used to be one main listening area. Now the main area could be the theater. But then people want to listen to it in their office. They want to listen to it in their bedrooms. Outdoor, I mean, my gosh, the outdoor audio business uh, has, continues to grow where, you know, people will, will, you know, like to go outside and spend, this, depending on where you live, of course, Seattle outdoors winter sure yeah not so much but florida california places like that and it's really fun to take your music outside above and beyond what you got inside there and so we have a whole line of of amplifiers that uh, that fit into that and what's unique about it is a lot of times when it comes to the whole house thing people make you know they think they, they would use power just enough to get by you know 20 watts 30 watts something like that mm -hmm. so you get what you get you know it's kind of like buying a, a, a you know you go and expecting it to go you know 100 miles an hour or whatever so you get um, what you pay for yeah exactly exactly so they go gosh it doesn't sound very good it sounds like an elevator yeah okay you use small speakers you use small amplifiers guess what you got well, now That's there's awesome. so many cool architectural speakers out there and in ceiling speakers, invisible speakers, you know, the out, like I said, the outdoor stuff um, in what, wherever you want them. Um, but the better ones need more power. And that's really kind sure. of people go, what's your secret sauce? Well, yeah, we have DSP and we run cool and stuff like that. But, you know, we put a lot of power. I mean, most of our distributed audio amps are 100 watts per channel, 8 ohms and even higher into 4 ohms, which, you know, do I need that much power? Not necessarily. But as, as everybody knows, as a listener, the, the extra power you have is like the extra headroom. It gives you mm -hmm. more warmth. They don't sound compressed. It doesn't sound nasally. You know, and all of a sudden, wow, even at low volumes or modest volumes, it sounds pretty good. And that's, I tell you, it's a fast-growing part of our business because people, you know, home theater, let's face it, how many theaters can you put in your house? Five. No more than five. Maybe six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my goal. One day. Yeah, exactly. Six. One day. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to, like, pick my, you know, five favorite manufacturers be like, okay, here's this room. 
right? And here's the theater for this other one. Yeah, exactly. That, that exactly. would be ridiculously awesome. You gotta have the bedroom run the outside one. So I get, I got a, I had a customer that called me and he was, you know, when we launched our new processors and he was very excited to get his new one, you know, wanted to get pushed to the front of the line, all that kind of stuff. And he goes, well, I have three other theaters that have your product in it. So I want to get this one. I'm like, well, Oh my God, you've got three that are already working. Let's let somebody else get one first, you know? <laughs> so that, that's super cool. Oh, major enthusiast. I love that stuff. So that, that that's awesome. Yeah. I guess, uh, I guess just like in cars, there's no replacement for displacement or wattage. Oh yeah, exactly. You can never have too much. That's cool. Well, let's, uh, let's take a second here. I want to call out some of the folks that are out in the, uh, the crowd today. Um, Hi-Fi Haven says, hey, everybody, he was first on. He beat everybody today. So welcome, welcome. everyone's challenge is to beat Hi-Fi Haven on the show next week. <laughs> so you, you got to do it. Um, and then uh, walking the walk of shame is double A because he missed last week. Yeah. And shame on you, man. But we're glad that you're here this week. Welcome, man. Um, so he says, Audio Control has some cool products. Never heard them, but excited. Uh, I have heard them and, and they're, they're really good. They're really good. And I think it was, what in, was it at CD 19 that you guys introduced your pre-pro line? Is that when that came out or did it come out before then? And that's just when I first, they, they hit my radar first. I think the, the new line, the X series, the X series. Uh, yeah. That's what yeah, I'm talking. We, we introduced those in uh, 2019. Okay. Um, and then we said, Hey, let's wait till there's a pandemic and then start shipping them. So yeah, oh, yeah totally. It was, it was, I can remember the days hand in hand, unfortunately, but, uh, so that was, but yeah, we, but prior to that, I mean, the, the generation we had before was a traditional 12 channel platform versus the 16 channel. And then we had some, some basic 5.1 stuff going back a few years. So we've been doing home theater in, in various shapes for 10 years or so home theater amplifiers. And, and actually we did some home theater EQ going back even further. So. Right on. And so today it looks like the, you know, the product portfolio is the Maestro X9 and X7 on the pre-pro, the processor side of the house, and then the concert XR8, 6, and 4 on the receiver or the, the AVR side of the house. Is that, am I translating you, that correctly? You did, you did an amazing job. Right on. Okay. Right on. Love it. All right. So a um, few more people here. Let's see who we got here. Um, the anonymous Facebook user loves audio control, at, Love you know. That. We, we do too. And uh -huh. he says that, or she, because I do have at least three female viewers, um, X9's live on every site. Right on. Cool. Um, Audio Architects is up in the house. And uh, this is Mike for folks that don't know. Everybody go check his channel out. Super awesome. He learned everything he knows from the master. <laughs> I'm sure he's loving that right now. And then another faceless Facebook user, Di uh, Dirac. Oh, a Dirac fan. All right. Yeah. I, dude, I, I like direct too. It does rock, especially with all the new subwoofer business that they got going over on over the last couple of years. Um, and Jim. Jim's Spir Brandio. Oh my Brandio. God. Yeah. I, I think this might be Jim's first time on the show. You apparently, Chris, you bring all the boys to the yard. Oh my God. Jim and I worked together a long, long time ago. So Jim's a good man. Good That's awesome. Thanks for joining up, Jim. Go subscribe. Come on. Yeah, you got to yeah. do it. Um, the whole bunch of other folks. I can't get hit everybody. Uh, Kevin S. Uh, Kevin Sorkin from uh, the fame of GSG Audio in Southern California. If you like subwoofers, this guy has got them in spades. Um, and Michael Christ, uh, will you be able to hear the sound? I'm sure we can. I don't know. Maybe. I, mean, I, I can hold my mic up to the... <laughs> uh, calibration tools rock. 100% agreed. Um uh, and Hi-Fi Haven, I think he was looking at those uh, processors and AVRs, and he likes the front panel on those. I think they're really cool, too. Um, James Drizzle? Dressel, maybe? Yeah. He wants an epicenter. I, I think this might be one of James, might be his first time here with us. So welcome, James. Glad to have you on the show with us. Yeah. Uh, Dan Black, I, another uh, new folks, new person here with us. He just jumped in. And uh, Dan, you have not missed the processor talk. We are going to have a... a, a long conversation about processors at, at about the 40 minute mark of the show. So make sure you hang out for that because it, it's coming. Um, James, not going to try your last name, but Hey man, 
Yeah. <laughs> Glad to have you on. Uh, uh, H Cinema is here with us. Uh, so lot, lots of folks on the show with us today. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're all here because, you know, I, I really can't say enough about audio control and, and, and their brand. I mean, this is, you know, I, it's a, a mix for me because it, it has two components to it. One, it's got that feeling of nostalgia, right? Meaning that this, this, you know, you're not like a flash in the pan, new kind of company that's just here for a little while and then you're gone. You've been around for a while. And, you know, my journey through audio and hi-fi has, you know, at different times touched on audio control over the years. And now that, you know, my focus is really a home theater, you guys are like really kind of all in punching with the big boys, right? So last year is what I call the year of the 16 channel processor. And, uh, you know, there were a handful of folks that kind of jumped into that arena. You know, you, you had the folks that have been doing it for a while, you know, the Storm Audios and the Trinovs and those folks. And But then, you know, you guys are in there mixing it up now. You've got Emotiva in there. Monolith jumped into the, the market. Uh, Accurus is in there. I love their stuff. Their Act 4 and their Muse is good. Man, I got to compare those one day, you guys versus them, because you, you're like my... In, in my heart, I love those products. I mean, they're, they're the ones that kind of move me. Um, but uh, but I'm really happy that you guys jumped in with those pre-pros uh, because that's like, that's next level. I mean, in, from from my point of view. Um, so so let, let's dig into, uh, to the, the, we got a trash talker in here, right? James, he's all like, is Audio Control a rebranded Arkham? <laughs> I don't know. And then somebody says, I bought an Anthem. Yay. Good, but uh, but I think this is a, a, a legit question here. Um, are you guys partnered with Harmon? Because I haven't heard anything from Harmon. I, I I wouldn't think that you guys are partnered with Harmon, but maybe somewhere somehow. No, I mean there is there's a certain number of companies out there that do HDMI development. You know, and that's what I think keeps everybody keeps everybody connected and, and monitoring and stuff like that. So we work with some partners out there that uh, um, that obviously uh, work with with other companies out there too to kind of keep everybody connected and doing those things. I mean. Mm -hmm. self-development of some of those technologies, you know, kind of like making your own Dolby chip or whatever. Well, um, it's like making on yeah. Dirac, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. No, and then it's like uh, if you think about some of your competitors that had some, you know, pretty significant issues around their uh, their HDMI 2.1 stuff, um, you know, and they're, they're sourcing their HDMI chipsets from companies that a lot of folks source those chipsets from. So, you know, I, I think from that point of view, there's a lot of crossover in, in the, the back end of the, the system. No, there. no, no pun intended, right? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I, I didn't try, but man, look at me. I'm getting good with no, y'all. I mean, we are, we're, we're chefs. I think we look, I mean, that's our engineering team here and stuff like that, where, you know, we have some things that we do from scratch, you know, stuff, circuit boards, um, burn in, you know, software development, things like that. There's other things. It's like transistors. Transistors use years used to be lots of little parts and pieces, and at some yep. point, transistor compresses technology into a single component. And that starts to happen more and more and more. Our guys work with the various suppliers out there to bring it all together, and then we do the assembly here, we do the testing here, and of course, we look at the feature set too, at the same time, saying what do customers want, and we take those and kind of put them all in the same box, um, and uh, add the, you know, the uh, an amplification section we're doing or something that we find is unique from an audio controls perspective and away we go that's cool that's cool and i've been set straight jim set me straight he's like i've been here don't he's like <laughs> don't represent otherwise he's all like i've been here uh okay so i'm supposed to ask you about anon 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 I don't, I don't know what that means, but I'm, oh, uh, I'm that's, you, yeah, that's, that's, Chris. that's one of the, uh, that's one of the, uh, partner suppliers out there that a lot of us work with. So I, I, I think that's what he's asking. So right on. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. Now, not only is there car audio and home theater, but you guys also have a, a pro business, right? And this is something that I personally know nothing about. And I don't know that I've ever clicked on this tab before, but I'm going to click on it right now for the first time ever. And I, I have no idea what's going to be in here. <laughs> um, all right. So, okay. So is this, uh, it looks like it's all about uh, DSP and that kind of stuff. Well, so you gotta... yeah, I mean, this is, you know, one of the products that's kind of walked alongside of our products. Um, you know, when you get into equalization, which is measurement and correction, right. uh, real time analyzers and right back to the flashing lights that you mentioned before an RTA 
you know, kind of like a prism takes a, a beam of light and breaks it into the colors. An RTA is a microphone. The microphone makes, basically measures pressure at different frequencies, and it takes that pressure, and it will show you, for instance, in an octave or third octave or whatever spacing. And we had a product called the SA3050, which was the cool flashing light. You know, I had one in my conference room here, but it's, it's in the other room. Um, we've taken that technology the last few years, and now it's, we're utilizing the power of a computer and an iPad and things like that. So we now have interface boxes, which is what the DMRT is. Oh, I got you right yeah. on. So, so if you so look you at it, it's, it's actually, it's like a, you see there, it's a preamp. So you've got microphone inputs, you've yeah. got uh, balanced inputs, unbalanced inputs, all sorts of stuff there. And you take that and you plug that into your laptop and there's software in your laptop and you can measure SPL, you can measure frequency response, uh, you can measure delay times. And for the car guys, there's actually a little oscilloscope in there and you can measure, you know, a lot of different things. And they're all good for, you know, speaker setup or calibration, you know, sure. and stuff like that. Um, and that rolls in and then we have a bunch of different microphones that allow you to, to uh, interface there. That's cool. So this uh, this looks like a more robust robust version of you know kind of the the software folks will download for free and drop on their mm -hmm. laptops and you know and and hack through that stuff at, at home. So that's that's cool. I didn't know you guys were were doing that. That's that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna I want to check that out one of these days. Okay. And we do have mics, for instance. You know, people would I, I've seen people go to calibrate. You know, they pick up their phone and they're calibrating, and you're like, oh no. Uh, mm -mm. No, 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 no. I mean, the software in the phones and things like that is powerful, but you got to have a microphone interface. And we have microphones that actually plug into your phone through the uh, the lightning jack and things like that, or through an XLR, depending on what you have. So, but yeah, there's a whole family of those guys. Yeah, that's cool. I like this. Jo Josephon C550H mm -hmm. instrumentation microphone. That's what I, I want something called an instrumentation microphone. I think that go. sounds cool. That's awesome. All right, so um, let's see, nobody, I don't think anybody else has jumped in. So at this point, we're going to move on. Well, oh, no, I, the one thing I forgot to talk about before we move on to Content Corner is, um, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and we, and we talked about this just a little bit before the, the episode is, but how, how do people get into the, to the ecosystem with you guys? So if they wanted to buy in and, and join the family, so to speak, where can they find your products? How do, how do, they, how do they join the family? Well, things like the microphones and such, you actually can buy those just directly off the website if you want to. I mean, that's usually a calibration tool, so you don't have a lot of dealers and people that, that support those or stock those or whatever. Uh, and we have a few internet places like Crutchfield and stuff that will sell those. Um, when you get into the full-blown home theater products, I mean, a lot of our uh, interface these days is through the custom installers or the CD channel. Mm -hmm. um, which is where I think you, you've seen us at Giles. And Absolutely. That's, a, that's an area that's been, you know, that year when we introduced the X-Series, uh, we had, I think, eight or nine different vendors, Dyn Audio and Origin Acoustic guys that all had audio control processors and amplifiers in their booths. So that's kind of where we grew from there. We have a dealer locator on our website, so we can kind of point you towards, you know, a dealer for you. But, you know, a lot of these guys have, um, being up front are integrator type of dealers. So sometimes you may connect with a dealer who may also, well, well, hopefully will also want to provide calibration services via Dirac. They may want to help you with your automation system, things of that sure. nature. So um, if you're looking for something like one of our amplifiers, like a, uh, one of the theater amplifiers or the Rialto or Bijou's, you know, then they can probably walk you through that channel too. But if you look at our dealer locator, and we sell, I mean, all over the U.S., uh, I think I have... Oh gosh, twenty-eight international distributors also. So um, cool. we've got a fair fair amount of contacts and stuff that are out there. And if you need to, pick up the phone and call us. Human beings answer our phone most of the time. You know, we don't really have a lot of <laughs> touch this, sure. dial that, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, we've got a really good team of people here. Great customer service, you know, just a lot of real passionate folks. That that's awesome. Yeah. And if you know any of the, any of you viewers out there, if you just lost and you, you you really want to get hooked up with somebody and you just you know are having a hard time, you know, just reach out to me and I'll I'll help bridge that divide as well and, and make sure you get to somebody that can get you to the right spot. Because if you're interested in this stuff, I want to make sure that you can get get access to it because I I, I love it. And are you guys gonna be at Cedia this year by any chance? We will. We will. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, we've got a uh, actually we've got a great booth right where the two main aisles intersect. Awesome. Uh, in Indianapolis, which is where Jim Sarandi is from. So, we'll oh, nice, see. nice. Yeah. That's cool. Um, any anything new coming? Any secrets? Um, anything you can tell things. us about? Um, probably a little early in the game. Ah, 
<laughs> when it's not early in the game, make sure you let Absolutely. me know so I can help break the news for you. I'm Absolutely. I love new stuff. Right on. Okay. We need, give, we need to give people reasons to come see us. Absolutely. Um, now though, let me find my little thingy here, my little button, because we are gonna move over and it's time for content corner. Now, let's take a break and stroll down to a cozy little place I like to call Content Corner. This is where we talk about all the content that we love to consume. And today, we're going to talk about some movies. <laughs> the old ones. Uh, should I leave the music in the background? I don't know. What do you think? It was, it was cool. Yeah. Oh, everybody's quiet. Why is everybody? I can't hear anything. Oh, okay. um, can you hear me okay? I hear I don't you. Know. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I pushed. I pushed the wrong button. Um, I watched three movies last week, and you know what's funny about that is, uh, you know, I do so much home theater content that I don't have time to <laughs> watch movies anymore. Um, but I finally watched A Quiet Place. Well, almost all of it, right? So A Quiet Place is interesting because it was a demo reel in just about everybody's Cedia demo and anywhere you go there, they'll play a scene from a quiet place. Right. And there's like great Atmos and huge bass and all that kind of stuff. But I had never watched it. And with the next movie coming out or just came out in the theater, you know, I felt that it was finally time, but I have to tell you, it was, uh, it was not easy for me to get through that movie because I, uh, I, I don't really get into the, uh, you know, the horror scary, Oh, there's so much tension built up and, you know, something's going to happen, right? Like, uh, have you seen this one yet? No, I haven't. All right. So I don't want to spoil it too much, but there are these monsters that will attack you if you make a sound, right? And the way that people don't get killed is they just stop making sounds. They, they don't really talk. They learn sign language. They put sand on the ground and walk with sand. Like, I mean, it's something like if you drop something on the floor and it made a sound, the monsters would come looking for you. But, you know, they set up all this stuff. Like there's this family and the, the wife is pregnant, right? So how's that going to work, right? How can you keep a baby quiet, right? And, uh, and there's this one scene where, you know, the, you have the mother and she's walking up these stairs and she's got like this bundle of clothes and like a sheet hangs down and it snags on a nail and in the stairs and it pulls this nail up and makes it point upward. And they just show that on the screen and you just know something, somebody's going to step on this thing and they're going to scream or, and then I'm just, I'm just like, my chest gets tight and I'm all like, oh, the stress. <laughs> it's horrible, right? Um, but anyway, so I finally went back and, and dug into that. But uh, the the two movies that I really want to mention today, and uh, these were picks by my wife, and we watched these with the kids because she wants to educate them a little bit more um, in you know the the ideas are around finance, creativity, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, and and then you know all technical acumen and that kind of stuff. So we watched. The Founder, which is about uh, McDonald's Corporation, right? So uh, the two guys who created the first McDonald's and then this other dude that comes in and steals it from them and just totally screws them over and treats them horribly, but turns it into this humongous international juggernaut of a company. Um, and then the other I watched was uh, called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And this is a story uh, set in Africa, and I forget the country, but, you know, they're going through a famine and they don't have any food and, you know, it's dry and they can't plant. Um, and he's a, a young kid, you know, like in a junior high school or high school, something like that. And he, uh, he figures out how to create um, a wind-powered pump for irrigation. Uh, so, you know, kind of a, a very moving movie, uh, and, and I really enjoyed that. So, you know, for folks out there looking for something interesting to watch that's kind of off the beaten path, it's not a big Marvel movie, it's not a big bang up, blow them up movie, but uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind is kind of interesting. It's, you know, it's a story of triumph and and all that kind of touchy-feely good stuff. Uh, Chris, anything uh, from your point of view, anything new that you've watched or, or heard or read or games you've played, anything out there that you would call out that folks might want to check out? Uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but if there's if there's something you want to throw out there, this yeah. would be the time. No, that's, I mean, there is, 
I mean, right now is a little bit of a, it's interesting with content and stuff like that. There's a lot of shows of things. I'm, and my son and I were kind of in an action mode these days. So um, I know a lot of the, uh, the traditional Marvel DC kind of stuff. Uh, we've been kind of working our way through the, um, uh, the uh, Avengers side of stuff. And so, so there's nothing probably particularly new, but I got to say, it's kind of cool to go back and, and rewatch them. I just rewatched a bunch of the uh, John Wick stuff. Oh, so yeah, good. Classic. I know, I know, which, you know, it obviously comes across as a, as a lot of shooting, and which it is. Oh, but, which is great. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. Okay. It's totally fine. The, scenes, the build up to the scenes, you know, in terms of the, uh, of when he goes into a quiet mode or like that scene where they're uh, starting the, the LP playing inside the, uh, uh, inside the safe, I guess, basically before the scene builds up, you know, some of those kind of things are, are pretty cool. Uh, I watched actually over the weekend, I watched the Bohemian Rhapsody again. Um, oh, that's really good. Yeah, yeah, I've always I liked that. And then, you know, it was interesting. You fade, you know, I mean, I grew up listening to Queen, you know, multiple mm -hmm. times and then it faded out. So it's kind of cool to see that come. And that concert scene at the end, uh, when they're doing Live Aid, I mean, you, oh, yeah. You know they don't they don't comp they don't compress that See, it's stretched out for I think 15 minutes or whatever and it's it's a perfect example of wow you know you just kind of get fired up and drawn into it and especially if you if you're a fan I'm an old rock and roll fan so a lot of that kind of stuff kind of draws you in so I'm kind of sounded good to too oh it yeah I mean really good I, we, that was kind of the demo I think we used just before you know some of our last shows kind of got put on hold and stuff like that so I'm kind of looking mm -hmm. forward to the studios releasing a lot of the stuff that's in the can. I hear there's a new Matrix coming out this fall. Yep. You know, there's yep. a Top Gun thing they're talking about. And it's kind of interesting. You know, those kind of movies, um, you know, whether you go back to Fifth Element or stuff like that, you know, yep. you watch some of those in the audio back then was, you know, you go, oh, my God, how imp impactful. Um, and it was good. But now you listen to some of the, uh, the movies that are coming out these days, it's like wow, they've kind of you know they've taken it to a whole nother level, and then you watch an old an old movie that you remember is a good movie, and you listen to it, and it's really an old old soundtrack, and you go, wow, you know, good yeah. a good a good movie with mediocre sound is you know just a mediocre movie. So good sound, good movie, you know, kind of brings it all together. Oh, you you got to have it all together, and I agree. There are a lot of movies coming out that I'm excited for. I'm really super excited for the remake of Dune. So they're, you know, they're going out for another dip into the Dune universe to, to see if they can get it right this time or not. And I certainly hope they do because, I, you know, I, I've read all the books and you know, I, I love the, the fiction and, and the series. And, you know, the other movies and the miniseries and all that kind of stuff were all right. But I don't think anybody has captured the essence yet. And it's very difficult to capture the essence of a book like that, because if you read the whole thing, I mean, it, it's, it's an immense universe, right? And it, it spans thousands and thousands and thousands of years, years of time. Um, but, you know, hopefully this little tiny snippet that they're going to try again at, uh, they, they get this in right. It's got a great looking cast. So I'm super, super duper excited for that one. Ooh. All right. Now, this is where we're shaking stuff up at tonight this is new so this is a segment that we haven't had in the show before and chris you're the guinea pig man <laughs> um, we we kind of wrap this into uh into the previous segment in the past but you know i want to call this out specifically and every week we're going to do this we're going to have a tech question of the week that we pose to the guest and you know that it'll be tailored to that guest's expertise and today's tech question chris this is something that comes up all the time. I, ha I get asked this question once, twice, three times a week. And the question is, what is the difference between an AVR and separates, meaning a pre-pro and amplifiers, and why would someone choose to go with an AVR or choose to go with a pre-pro and separates? So, you know, amplifier and, and the processor. So, you know, what, what are they and why do you choose one or the other? Um, definitely the sixty-four thousand dollar question. As I, it, and it could be sixty-four thousand dollars just depending on what, yeah, exactly. what you choose to buy. You know, I think it's it's kind of the evolution of what you're trying to do with your system. Um, you know, and one obviously in a receiver, um, you know, you have amplification built into it. And uh, honestly, it's, it's been kind of interesting as the receiver market over time has has shifted. You see a lot of oh marketed numbers, but not really. You know. I call them marketing watts versus engineering watts. So I right. think at the end of the day, whatever the silkscreen says on there sometimes may not necessarily be the same apples and apples. You know, 
You got a car that goes 140 miles an hour. You got another one that has 140. One's a four cylinder, one's an eight cylinder. You know, what's, what's going to be the differences there in the horsepower? So number one, you want to make sure you're comparing apples and apples. And, you know, our amplifiers that we use, either whether it's in the receiver or the standalone ones, you know, we uh, kind of coined the phrase years ago about all channels driven because people would say, oh, our amplifier puts out 100 watts, blah, 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 blah. You go, wait, what, what was all that? You know, <laughs> and it was only... It only two channels. <laughs> exactly. Two channels into four ohms playing a 1K test tone. So, you know, there's there's a, a, some comparisons, obviously, to be accurate. And that's why, you know, you pick up some of the receivers these days from, from companies um, that will stay nameless or whatever, and they weigh nothing, you know, and you kind of go, huh, how did they get 180 watts or whatever they call in there and stuff like that. So, you know, whatever you choose, you want to certainly make, and I'm a little disappointed some days in some of the, the uh, companies have been out there a long, long time receivers. Is they, they, they've got so many networks, features, and switches and stuff, which are all cool and everything, but they've kind of let the amplifier part of it slip a little bit. So sure. having the horsepower is important. And secondly, I mean, when you have you have a power supply inside of a product, um, and if that power supply is driving uh, the processor and the receiver, you know, it has it has multiple functions to do. If that power supply is only focused on the amplification section, it's going to do a better job on the amplifier. So a standalone amplifier, and you know, this is coming from a company that does both, you know, a standalone amplifier inevitably is going to give you more power and more horsepower. Um, and, you know, I'm going to have all that headroom. So a, a 200 watt amplifier, you know, can fit inside of a chassis um, and you can get one that's going to play down the low impedances and stuff, which is going to be tough to get a receiver to do that. So there's performance benefits of going with separates because you can have a processor and if you have a processor with its own power supply, you can inevitably have a quieter system inside the processor and then you can have a standalone amplifier. Um, now, what, what kind of power do you need? Well, if it's a, you know, it's a home theater in a, you know, a modest sized room, 12 by 12, something like that, and you've got in-wall speakers and things like that, you know, maybe a receiver, you know, it's going to give you a good power level. Whatever you do is don't underpower your speakers. I think, you know, no one, right. people are always worried, oh, I'm going to have too much power. I'm going to blow my speakers. I very rarely hear about people blowing speakers because they have too much power. They a lot of times will damage their speakers because they don't give it enough power. And then, yeah, they have a, an action moment. They lock onto that movie they like, and all of a sudden they want to turn it up a little bit more, a little bit more. And that's where headroom comes in. So do you need, like I said before, do you need a couple hundred watts? Yeah, not necessarily, but the headroom, the warmth that comes with that, the depth that comes with that, just the, the more musicality. But if you don't have a lot of power, you're going to have that problem. A standalone amplifier will give you that. So separates with a standalone amplifier will be able to do that. Now, if you've got speakers, as you know, theater speakers get better and better all the time, even the, the uh, in-wall uh, systems and stuff like that, they tend to be more accurate and more accurate. Speakers tend to need more power. You know, and then you get into a larger room, you're going to need more power to fill up with that larger room, particularly as you get into the lower frequencies. You know, when people do all these room calculations, sometimes I think they forget that, you know, the room, especially if it's an open space and it may be feeding into other smaller rooms or it's feeding into larger ceilings, you need to compensate for all that. That's a little bit more of a subword for discussion, but you need want to be able to have that kind of power. So you're going to ultimately get a better performance from having a separate, you know, with a processor and amplifier. And then, you know, there's definitely a wow factor of having, you know, a rack of gear sitting there. <laughs> you know? There, there is that. Yeah. yeah. So one comment I'll make is one, one benefit that I found uh, moving up from uh, a integrated unit to separates was that, one, you get the flexibility of choosing the components that you want, right? So you can pick out, okay, this is the perfect processor for me. It does what I need it to do. It's got the right number of channels for me. And in the past, if you wanted a lot of channels, your only option was to go with a processor. Now you've, you've got, uh, uh, gosh, what, 13 channel um, receivers now? Is there, I don't know if there's a 16 channel receiver out there that's got 16 channels of amplification in it, but I think I think somebody's got a 13, but if you wanted to go for a larger channel count and to go into a more sophisticated environment, you, you had to go with a processor. But I like being able to select, okay, here's the amplification I want. Here, here's the processor with the, uh, the features that I want. And another thing, and I, I don't know uh, if this is true to your product line or not, but in some product lines, when you go with the processor, the dedicated processor line, those become a bit more upgradable than what you see 
in the uh, in, in just the the straight receivers or AVRs, right? So when you have technology changes, you know some units. Okay, you can change the HDMI board out and go from you know version 1.4a to 2.1 or what you know whatever it might be. So you know there is some of that that's out there too. Um, and then I've also seen some processors have longer warranties than uh, than non processors as as well. But and those are kind of just general blanket statements uh, for for the technologies. Um, any anything else that we should add to that for folks that are trying to make this decision? I mean, there's the cost aspect, right? So separates are, are going to cost more, right? Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes it can be a lot more. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that covers it. No, I think I think you hit on all the key points there. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I remember you know the first five point one system I had I listened to, and I thought, wow, how could this get any better? And then you heard a 7.1 system and then you heard a 7.2 uh, system. So, um, and yeah, I would like to think, you know, the 16 channels we have out there and there's obviously some processors even have more channels. You go, gosh, how many more can you have before the, you know, the walls fall apart like Swiss cheese and stuff like that, you know, from the speakers that are in them and stuff. Um, so I think, you know, this is kind of relative to, you know, we're, we're you know, going from that making uh, the industry is making a, a slow shift from a 4k to an 8k platform now we need sources and displays and all the other and content you know what a there's, there's yeah a content saying. yeah exactly. that's the hard part yeah exactly. you make the equipment there's just no content so there's a lot of future proofing out there much like you buy a future proofed um uh computer and stuff like that mm -hmm. um you know i i def you know if i if i'm looking to invest my money sometimes i look at amplification and speakers as those ones that are pretty much going to be the stalwarts you know, and there may be something that comes down the road that we're not even talking, that we don't even know about, you know. Uh, another surround format that Dolby or the new IMAX Enhanced or someone comes out with, you know, that requires something a little different. So then in that case, the processor could be changed easier than taking out the receiver and things like that. Receivers typically are going to be for, you know, maybe a smaller room, um, a little bit more restricted, you know, depending on what you're doing, you know, and the type of speakers you're doing. I mean, we've got our XR8. I mean, that's probably the biggest receiver that's out there. I mean, that's a 200 watt, four ohm stable, you know, class H wow, amplifier. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a monster of a receiver. But, and I think a lot of times people buy that, they might be thinking separates, but it depends also how much space they have in their racks and their equipment closets and stuff like that. And some people like to have, you know, walls and walls, and some like to have kind of what I have here, you know, just kind of a smaller environment too. So. Uh, but yeah, making sure whatever gets got the horsepower from there. So awesome. awesome. Very cool. And, we, and by the way, we give a five year warranty on our receivers, our pre pro. Oh, you awesome. know. Yeah. So if we fix it's funny. We fix some of those products we talked about earlier phase couple activators, C 101s we made 30, 40 years ago. We, we get people sending those in for service every day. <laughs> or what is this? I bought it. What, what do I do with it? So, mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, thank you for that answer. And we have a handful of questions, I think, to run through quickly before I move into the cleanup section of the, the show today. But uh, Brolic Media, what's up, man? He uh, He's like, I need more than 16 channels. What do I do? How do I stay in the audio control ecosystem? Um, you guys got something coming? Is more than 16 oh, on the horizon? Always we're always looking. You know, right on. So we'll put that one in as a feature request. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and let me how see. How many channels? <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's funny um, because you're 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 right. I mean, how many channels can you can you go for? Um, I I'm up to 13 channels in in my room right now, and I'm like, do I need many more? I mean, because <laughs> I'm not going to do six Atmos. I've got four, and that that's enough. Um, I guess you know I, I do use like a mini DSP for subwoofer channels, so I could go discrete on all you know the subwoofers and then do all of the, the DSP stuff in the processor. So that might, might be useful, but yeah, I mean, at some point you get out of a piece of equipment that's realistic for 99% of the consumers out there. Right. And, you know, once you're up to like a 32 channel processor, you know, how many of those do you think sell in the United States per year? Yeah. Um, it's, 20 it's, or 30 yeah, or something. Exactly. Like, I mean, from all brands or something like that. Yeah. You get into a little rarefied, rarefied air. All right. So we are moving on and uh, this is the cleanup section. So this is all the new stuff that's coming up in the future for everybody. So uh, home theater fanatics, 
upcoming projects. Um, I'm working on a review of the Atlantic Technology 8600 series 5.1 speaker system. And uh, these are really cool. So I put the unboxings up already on the channel. Um, so if that's wet your appetite at all, uh, I'll be uh, I'll be working on that here in the immediate future. And I'm going to bring in uh, my buddy Gabe from uh, Echo Home Theater here in Castle Rock, Colorado. And he's going to help me do this video. So uh, it's going to be another crossover event. Um, and, and I'm excited for that. I'm also continuing to work on the Harbottle Audio M18X build. So, uh, man, this has been an adventure because, you know, this is a, uh, you know, it's a Baltic Birch box with an 18 inch subwoofer. It's sealed um, and it's quasi DIY, meaning that they send it to you. You could just use it as it is. But if you want to finish it, you have the opportunity to finish it in whatever way matches your room. So you're not paying them to do it and you get a little bit of cost savings there. If you're going to stick it behind the screen, you just plug it in, go to town. But if you want it outside, you probably want to do something with it. And, uh, you know, you always have the option to blow Duratex on it or something like that, or roll some paint on it. But since it's actual plywood as opposed to MDF, I decided to try and stain it. And I've never stained anything in my life before. And this has been absolutely banana crazy trying to figure out how to do this stain stuff. And, you know, so I did the, the pre-treatment on the wood and then I put the stain on and I did another of the stain. And then I started putting the top coat on. But when I put the top coat on, it ran a little bit. But where it ran at, it pulled the stain out. So it was like, oh, it was I, lots of learning. So if you're interested in in seeing the pitfalls that you can go through as you try and do this kind of work on your own. When this video comes out, I strongly recommend you watch it because it's a learning experience for me. And hopefully by watching this, this will show you some of the things that you want to watch out for when you try and do this yourself. But uh, I do think that in a perfect world, you can take a Baltic birch enclosure and, you know, a lot of people will take that and buy a nice veneer and put on top of it, but you can make that look pretty darn good. So that's, uh, you know, that's kind of exciting. And uh, of course, in the video, I'll, I'll show you all the measurements for the M18X and we'll talk about its performance and a little hint there. It's, it's an absolute beast. Uh, and, you know, I love seal subs. And, uh, and this thing brings uh, brings the low base in spades. Um, you know, I've got this thing hooked up to a bridge channel off of uh, FP10,000Q. And it's, it's just, man, this thing, this thing's rocking. It, it, it rocks pretty hard. Um, this week's video is going to be the Atlantic Technology Gate Crasher 3 set. So this is a 5.1 system uh, sound bar using the SCA uh, protocol for wireless connectivity out to the satellites and the subwoofer. So if you're looking for that kind of environment, that video is going to drop as soon as I can get it posted. And I've uploaded it to, to YouTube and I was making the thumbnail just before uh, we started uh, streaming tonight. So that should, I might release it tonight at midnight or something crazy, um, but that'll be out there. So check that one out. Uh, man, that's, that's all I've got. Chris, thank you so much for coming on oh, the show. Yeah. Oh, great time. Enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Great to connect with, uh, connect with all the listeners here. Good good feedback there on, on ideas and such. So but, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, if anybody wants more information about audio control in, uh, in the notes, I'll put down all the links so you can go check out everything that they've got going. And, uh, you know, if you want to see this thing live, you know, in living color, I would recommend checking out Cedia if you can make it over there. Um, because that, you know, just like Chris said, they'll have a, a nice booth at the intersection of two of the main aisles, wherever that is. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Hey, I'll be there too. So, um, looking forward to that and that'll be a great place to check it out. I'll cover it for everybody that can't be there though. So you can kind of see what they've got going on and, uh, and live vicariously, uh, to some extent. So, um, again, everybody, thanks so much. Uh, if you haven't yet take a moment, like, and subscribe. If you've used audio control in the past, or if you have any more questions, please drop those down below in the comments and I'll do everything I can to make sure you get an answer to whatever you want to know. And if there's any other information, I'll try and point you in the right direction for that as well. So in conclusion, thanks everybody. And as always, we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.